This is The Dragon's Roar by Priestess of Groove, narrated by Riley Rocks. Chapter 34 Sir Barristan 1 He watched King Aemon pace around the tent. Normally his king was remarkably implacable for a boy his age, but he's not really a boy. He had to remind himself. He shivered when he thought back to the story Eamon had told him. At any other time, Eamon would have been thoroughly dismissed for crazed imaginings, but certain pieces of the puzzle regarding Jamie Lannister had finally fit into place. Once upon a time, Jamie Lannister had fallen in love with a warrior woman named Brienne and that's why he called for her during his worst nightmares in the White Tower. It's why Jamie had such a haunted look in his eyes, when Barristan knew full well it hadn't been there right after his murder of King Aerys Targaryen II. At first, Barristan thought perhaps his lecture had gotten through to him, but that had happened even a few months before Jamie had undergone a complete personality change. He had been so incensed by Jamie murdering the king and then retaining his position as a king's guard. He refused to engage with Jamie at all, unless it was to tell him his guarding shifts or to train. Jamie had allowed him to. Even after the sting had finally lessened, Barristan found he was too busy working with the other king's guard and trying to fill the empty spots to pay much attention to him. Jamie's eyes had shined with excitement and delight when Sir Arthur Dane had knighted him, and even after he'd been inducted into the King's Guard, he still retained some of that youthful energy. That had clearly been stripped away by the war. He had his moments of arrogance on the training grounds, where he still enjoyed showing his superior fighting skills. But outside of battle, he barely smiled at all. Then... One day he'd woken up, and he hadn't been able to fight at all. He kept looking at his sword hand as if it was foreign to him, and Sir Barristan had bested. "'Are you well, Sir Jamie? I bested you easily,' he had asked, feeling reinvigorated by finally taking the fight against him for the first time in nearly three years." He would never forget the way Jamie seemed to look right through him, as though he were meeting him again for the first time. Then he said, Again. This time Barristan took it easier on him, and was alarmed by how drastically Jamie had changed in just one day. He kept misplacing his feet. His stance was no longer attuned to his right hand. His instincts are backwards he thought, as Jamie jumped to the left instead of to the right and took a blow right in the ribs. Each time they fought, he would shake out his right hand as though it weren't working properly. What is going on? What's wrong with your hand? Should I fetch the maester for you? Nothing, Jamie snapped. I just need practice. Again. He switched his sword to his left hand this time. He was even worse with the left hand, and for the first time since King Ares died, Jamie looked afraid. Instead of dueling with him again, he turned to practice dummies. It was only a few days later, after the king had a few days with his new wife, the Queen Cersei, that Barristan had informed him of Jamie's regression. At first, the king had merely hand-waved it away, but then he saw Jamie struggling to go through the basic moves— and he consulted with Barristan. Queen Cersei had ordered Grand Maester Pycelle to look after her brother, though he insisted he was fine. And after a discussion with the king, they brought him up and nearly ejected him from the king's guard. We can't have a king's guard who can't fight, the king had snarled. Please, your grace, I insist this is only an inconvenience. Give me a month, and I'll be able to take Sir Mannon Moore in a straight fight. Sir Jamie had begged. He never thought Jamie would ever reduce himself to the humiliation of begging. 
but he had. It was then that Barristan had wondered, For a man who murdered the first king he served, why in seven hells would he want to continue serving? He was well aware that Tywin Lannister had been working on the king to release his son from his vows. Jamie had won the month for recovery, and by the end of it, he was a hair's breadth from taking him in the ring. Barristan had once again puzzled over Jamie's quick recovery. It's like he had forgotten certain habits, but once they resurfaced, he put them back on like a familiar shirt. However, the story of Jamie returning with his memories made that series of events fall into place. Jamie had been forced to adapt to his left hand when he'd lost his sword hand, which was why his instincts were backwards, and why he kept looking at his right hand as if he'd forgotten he had one. Eventually, Jamie had settled into a routine of training and guarding, silent as a statue. Sir Barristan soon grew used to his silence and forgot about him, instead focusing on the new additions to the king's guard. Such a great many mistakes I've made, he thought, as he followed the king's pacing. He didn't need to be there. Sir Aris and Sir Preston were guarding the tent. He should be in bed himself, preparing for the coming battle. But he could not sleep as long as his king failed to sleep. Never had Aemon reminded him so strongly of Rhaegar until now. While Rhaegar had been at least ten years older than Aemon was now, Neither one should have been forced to bear their burden. He had seen how it had consumed his prince, and he was determined to ensure it did not consume Aemon. By comparison, Aemon had much stronger support. Though he still found Jaime suspect, there was no doubt that he brought comfort and assurance to Aemon. Where he was now, though, was anyone's guess and he dearly wished he would haul the hand of the king to the tent now to soothe Aemon's fears and doubts. Lord Stark was the other, and he had been notably absent for the last month. He had been there when Aemon had confessed the illegitimacy of the letter to his uncle. Sir Barristan had suspected already that it was a forgery, though he did not engage in such pursuits. He knew well enough how difficult it was to secure information and that letter had had entirely too much for any man to feel safe putting down on paper. But where Barristan had swelled up in pride at seeing Rhaegar's son successfully make a move in the game, Ned Stark deflated. That had caused Aemon to deflate as well. He praised Aemon for his guile, but the words coming from him were not the same coming from his uncle. He had grown up a stain on Lord Stark's honor. All he ever wanted was to please his supposed father, until he became king. He could feel a dull anger low in his belly, at the thought that the king had been forced to endure scorn while he was hiding, and he had been displeased to hear about Lady Catelyn's treatment of him. Ignorance of his true origins was hardly an excuse for shaming a boy for his supposed father's misdeeds. "'Your grace,' You should rest. It's your first real battle tomorrow. You'll want to be sharp, Sir Barristan suddenly said. Eamon turned to him as though he'd forgotten his presence, and then shook his head. I will find no rest this night, Sir Barristan. There's no reason you cannot sleep, though. Get some rest while you can, he said. Though it was not an order, it was a very clear dismissal. Very well, Your Grace. I'll be here at dawn to ensure you're prepared, he said. Eamon just waved him away and ducked out of the tent. Most of the preparations for battle had already been made, so the encampment was surprisingly quiet. A low rumble broke the silence, and he looked to see a storm in the distance flashing with lightning. He'd watch countless storms like this pass the city to the north. The day would be dry, but the very air seemed to crackle with energy. He carefully picked his way around the camp, but he wasn't heading back to his tent. Lord Stark was still sitting around his fire, 
sharing it with the great John, his son, and Theon Greyjoy. The two boys were chattering excitedly, and the great John was guzzling beer, but Ned was quiet as he polished his breastplate. Lord Stark, a word, if you please. Ned considered him carefully, and then nodded, getting up to follow. Barristan walked through the camp for some time, and Ned finally asked, "'What is it you wanted to speak about?' "'Not here,' he insisted. His and Ned's horses were tied up with the rest of the northern camp. A stable boy jumped up at their approach, but Barristan waved him away and he slumped. He didn't bother saddling his horse as he climbed atop it. Ned followed his suit and rode bareback. It took nearly an hour of riding to get through the camp, and finally out into a deserted part of the field, where Barristan felt it would be safe enough to talk without anyone overhearing. He stayed atop his horse, as he turned it to address Ned. Lord Stark, I am merely a king's guard. I have served King Aerys Targaryen the Second, Robert Baratheon, and now Aemon Targaryen. I have unparalleled experience in the brevity of politics, and I have much to offer. However, I cannot compare to the advice that a father figure can give. You are Aemon's father. You are the only father he's ever known. And now you are hurting him with your distance and your silence. Why? Ned gave him a sharp look. I was rather under the impression that my counsel was no longer needed. Of course it's needed. You are a man of honor. And duty. There is still much for you to teach Eamon. He needs someone in the keep who can ensure that he does not lose his honor or his head trying to fight for his throne. What is it really about? I've lost him, Sir Barristan. That is not my son any more. He works in lies and secrets just as readily as his enemies do. He barely acknowledges my advice. He heeds Lord Jamie Lannister more than me. Going after Lord Jamie was not your best move. He's trying to create a team, and you two being at each other's throats is not helping him. Be better than Jamie Lannister. Put aside your food with him, and embrace your role with King Aemon as a steady rock and a sea of chaos. Ned's face grew dark. The man murdered his king, Aemon's grandfather. How can I trust that he won't do the same to Aemon at his first opportunity? Barristan frowned severely. Yes, he did. However, Jamie did not kill Robert Baratheon. He doesn't just kill kings when it suits him. I was blind to it at first. But my years with Jamie Lannister, and then the story that connects the two of them, had led me to believe that there was more to the killing than Jamie is willing to say. Don't make the same mistakes with Aemon that I made with Jamie Lannister. Ned gave him a puzzled look. I don't understand. I have never spoken ill of my brothers, and I never intend to. That does not mean I don't think ill of them at times, and I consider Jamie the worst. Much like you, I felt his honor was strained forever, and it humiliated me to serve the king with such a bastard. Instead of addressing the issue, perhaps finding the true reason, I ignored him as much as I could. He made it easy. He never raised objections, and did his duty as he was always supposed to. Then one day, he tried to kill himself. Sir Barrison said, and he heard Ned suck in a breath. He came back to the White Sour just in time for the evening meal with a nasty bruise around his throat. I asked him what happened. He just shook his head and went to his room. Ever seen how a hangman looks? They have deep blue bruises around their necks. Jamie's matched it perfectly. I asked him again the next day what happened and he refused to say. Rumors were he had a rough time with a prostitute. But he never did break his vow of celibacy while a king's guard. 
not like many of his brothers. No matter if it was Jamie the Kingslayer, a man of the King's Guard I was in charge of, tried to end his life, and I had no idea until it was too late. It made me realize my own failures as Lord Commander. Now I know that the burden of carrying memories of a tragedy and a horror that no one else had must have become too much to bear, and he saw no recourse but to end it all. Barristan met Ned's eyes once more, and he said, <clears throat> I failed Jamie Lannister. I will not fail Eamon. And you won't either. You and I both know what it cost him to retain his honor in his previous life, and what it cost you. Honor is admirable, Lord Stark, but it's a handicap here in King's Landing. Don't force him to shackle himself to it for your approval. Suddenly, a ringing noise crossed the sky to them, and they both turned. Those are the bells of the Red Keep, Barristan said, his heart pounding. He glanced up at the sky and was found the half-moon still on its way to dawn. Dawn was still a ways off. Let her be back. With luck, it will have nothing to do with Eamon, Ned said. He was in his tent when I left to speak with you. Something he ordered, then. That caused Barristan to stare. Eamon certainly had seemed more anxious than he should be for a battle that was going to be won easily. They hurried the horses back at a gallop, no doubt disturbing some of the soldiers with their urgency. They pulled up in front of the tent at the same time Jamie left. He seemed not to notice him as they wandered off, but Barristan noted that he was dressed in black from head to toe. They dismounted, handing their horses off to the stable boys nearby. Sir Barristan almost forgot himself and strode straight into the tent, so he stopped outside and said, "'Your Grace, it's Sir Barristan and Lord Stark. Might we enter?' "'Come in.' The Aemon that greeted him now was like a difference of night and day. He looked tired, but he was smiling, where his energy had been anxious before— now it was excited. The Red Keep has been surrendered. We march in to claim it at dawn. Barristan glanced at Ned to find his astonishment mirrored. How? Ned asked. Eamon then stepped aside to reveal a man slouched in a chair, with his hands tied behind his back. Why, Renly here has been most helpful in that regard. Isn't that right, Renly? The man glanced up to give Eamon a dirty look, but then he slouched again. There was no mistaking the finely trimmed beard as anyone but Renly's. "'How did you get a hold of him?' Barristan asked, awe in his voice. "'It was Jamie and his team. They snuck into the keep through the underground tunnels and snatched him.' "'I'll be damned,' Barristan whispered. If all goes well, the keep will have been taken bloodlessly. The Seven Kingdoms will have been united bloodlessly. He swayed. How is this possible? There was no denying that Aemon and Jamie, of all people, had worked hard to reach this point. If that's not a sign that the king is God's ordained, then I don't know what is. Uncle? Yes, your grace. Ready the soldiers. I trust the North to not bring undue violence onto any resisting soldier or lord. We need a minimum of five thousand to ensure control of the keep. Of course, your grace, Ned replied and flew from the tent. Sir Barristan, keep your eye on Renly. I need to inform Lord Umber. He's in charge of the army while we settle into the Red Keep. And with that, Eamon was gone along with Sir Preston and Sir Eris. All was quiet. He could only hear the quiet, frightened gasps of Renly as he continued to sit in the chair, despite not being tied to it. After a few minutes, he could hear the shouts of orders as men came awake to do their king's bidding. As he stood there, waiting for his king to return, Renly spoke up in a quiet voice. "'Why did you betray my brother, Sir Barristan? "'I thought you were a man of honor.' 
He finally looked up, and although his eyes were shiny with unshed tears, he was calm. Barristan frowned. Perhaps I am not a man of honor, but I don't feel I betrayed your brother. My first oath was a king's guard was to the Targaryen family. I'm honor-bound to serve King Aemon Targaryen. How do you even know he is who he says he is? He hardly looks Targaryen. I have seen and heard enough evidence in that regard to make the determination that he is Prince Rhaegar's last true-born son. Why would anyone sane ever wish to see them return to power? The Targaryens were the ones who tore this realm apart in the war when they burned lords and their heirs. King Aerys II is responsible for Robert's rebellion. King Aemon doesn't deny that. It is a result of King Aerys' action that neither of his grandfathers or even his father are alive for him to see today. Renly shivered, but for what reasons Barristan couldn't see. Q heard him at the negotiations. His soldiers would pour over the walls like lava that sealed old Valeria in its doom? Does that sound like a king who won't evidently burn people for saying one wrong word? Barristan raised his eyebrows at Renly. He offered you a hand in peace, and you spat in his face, insulting his poor dead mother. And yet, here you are, untouched. King's Landing is safe. The people will not have to fear for their lives in a foolish battle for the keep. You had your chance, Renly. Now you must live with it. Eamon returned in the next few minutes, and Renly was hauled out to be tied to a horse. By the time Jamie Lannister returned, there was a noticeable rosy lightning on the eastern horizon. At Eamon's command, a column of soldiers began marching towards the city. King Eamon, Jamie, Ned, and Barristan himself were at the head on horseback. Though he was in the second row, keeping a hand on Renly's reins. Aemon looked every inch the king he was meant to be, with his silver crown, wearing fine black fabrics lined with the bright red of his house. His cape was black with red on the underside. When they reached the lion's gate, Aemon looked back at Renly and said, Go on, Renly. Open the gate. Sir Barristan tugged his horse forward, so that Renly could be easily seen. He remained slumped and silent. Renly? He growled, tugging on the horse's reins. Slowly he looked up to the guards on the wall, who had been watching the whole affair quietly. Then he said, I am Renly Baratheon, Lord of Storm's End and Paramount of the Stormlands. I have surrendered King's Landing in the Red Keep. Open the gate. There was a few minutes as they could hear the soldiers scrambling around on the other side. Then, there was a grinding of gears as the gate slowly lifted. As soon as it was locked into place, Eamon nudged his horse forward and under the archway. The streets were still empty this early in the morning. However... Barristan could see eyes peering at them from windows in alleyways, staring after the procession. As they neared the keep, the people cautiously stepped out of their homes to watch them pass. There was no denying caution and fear in their expressions and movements, but the lack of any violence seems to have created some confusion as well. Their progression was followed with an eerie silence. The guards atop the walls of the Red Keep saw them coming, and even from that distance, Barristan could see the gate to the Red Keep was lifting without Renly giving the orders. I think it is likely all the soldiers in the Red Keep would have simply thrown down their arms if ordered to fight, Barristan thought. Still, he did not breathe a sigh of relief until King Aemon passed under the gate. I left with one king, and returned home with another. End of Book One